In 1961, the newly elected president, John F. Kennedy, recognized the challenges faced by civilian aviation due to its rapid growth. To address these problems, the US Federal Aviation Administration initiated a large-scale program called Project Horizon. The objective of this project was to support the development of a new generation of airliners that would accommodate the increasing air traffic and alleviate infrastructure constraints. There were two proposed approaches to achieve this goal, making planes faster to transport more passengers in less time, or making planes larger to accommodate more passengers with fewer aircraft. The FAA leaders opted for the first option, favoring the development of supersonic airliners as they believed these aircraft would dominate the commercial market. They actively promoted the concept to the US government. However, they faced opposition from the advocates of the wide-body aircraft concept. The Kennedy administration did not provide support to the proponents of supersonic aircraft, and the then US Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, expressed skepticism about the readiness of the aviation industry for such advanced machines. McNamara's opinion carried significant weight and could influence the course of development. Supporters of supersonic aircraft highlighted the speed advantages that could solve the problem of overloaded infrastructure. On the other hand, opponents raised concerns about potential environmental risks, high maintenance costs, and fuel consumption. However, the dispute was ultimately settled by the Europeans. In 1962, BAC and Sud Aviation formed a consortium and announced the official launch of the Concorde program, the world's first supersonic airliner. With strong support from the French and UK governments, the prospects of supersonic flights became prominent. There was widespread belief that these aircrafts would revolutionize air travel and that the Europeans, being the first to create such an aircraft, would dominate the aviation market. This development worried the Americans, who suddenly found themselves falling behind, as they were not only trailing the Europeans, but also the Soviets, who were also working on their own supersonic airliner. This setback came after the Soviets had already launched satellites into space and sent the first human into orbit the year before. The pressure to catch up with competitors prompted the FAA to send letters to President Kennedy just days after the Concorde project was announced. The letters emphasized that if the US did not advance in the field of supersonic transport, the country would lose tens of thousands of jobs, billions of dollars, and miss out on important future technologies. I'm announcing today that the United States will commit itself to an important new program in civilian aviation. It is my judgment that this government should immediately commence a new program in partnership with private industry to develop at the earliest practical date the prototype of a commercially successful supersonic transport superior to that being built in any other country of the world. In 1963, President Kennedy announced a major supersonic plane program and invited manufacturers to participate in a design competition. The program set ambitious goals, including developing an aircraft significantly faster and larger than the Concorde while maintaining comparable economic efficiency to regular subsonic jets. Several companies, including Boeing, Lockheed, North American Aviation, Douglas and Corvair, competed for the contract. Douglas presented their model 2229, which could seat 100 passengers and weighed about 420,000 pounds making it heavier than the Boeing 707, but with 20% fewer passenger capacity. However, the model's small capacity made its fuel burn unjustifiable in terms of operational costs, so the design was dropped in the preliminary stages. Corvair based their Model 58-9 on their B-58 supersonic bomber. However, designing a supersonic airliner involved more than just adding larger engines and a wider fuselage to an existing military aircraft. The design did not meet the speed expectations to surpass the Concorde, so it was not selected. The North American aviation design, the NAC-60, was deemed too small and slow to compete with the Concorde, leading to its rejection. Ultimately, Boeing's design, the 733197, and Lockheed's L-2000 advanced to the final stages of the competition. In 1966, Boeing and Lockheed faced off with Boeing ultimately winning the contract in 1967. 
While Lockheed's L-2000 was considered easier to produce and less risky for investors, its performance was slightly lower, and its noise levels were higher, making it unsuitable for a supersonic airliner. With the contract secured and ample funding, Boeing began its work on the project. The Boeing 2707, similar to other supersonic transports, had a sleek and aerodynamically efficient design. However, it possessed a unique feature for an aircraft of its size, a variable geometry wing. This innovative wing design allowed for adaptability during different phases of flight. During takeoff and landing, the wings of the 2707 would be pivoted forward, enabling the aircraft to operate at lower speeds while maintaining increased control. This configuration was particularly useful during critical maneuvers during takeoff and landing. In contrast, during supersonic cruise, when the aircraft approached speeds nearing three times the speed of sound, the wings would be swept back. This adjustment was necessary to counter the significant aerodynamic drag that the aircraft would encounter at such high velocities. By sweeping the wings back, the 2707 could minimize drag and maintain stability during supersonic flight. The Boeing 2707 was equipped with four turbojets that featured afterburners for increased thrust. These engines were positioned in a unique configuration under the aircraft at the rear. However, this placement caused the plane to become rear heavy. To accommodate the additional weight and maintain balance, the 2707 required an extra set of landing gear. This was necessary to ensure stable landings and takeoffs despite the rear heavy design. Due to the anticipated cruising speed of the 2707, which was considerably faster than the Concorde, the aircraft would experience significant atmospheric friction during flight. This friction would lead to the exterior of the 2707 heating up to temperatures reaching several hundred degrees Fahrenheit. These temperatures were high enough to soften regular aircraft aluminium, necessitating the use of specialized materials and construction techniques to withstand the extreme heat generated during supersonic travel. To address the challenges posed by the high temperatures generated during supersonic flight, Boeing opted to construct the fuselage of the 2707 using titanium, a material known for its excellent heat-resistant properties. This choice allowed the aircraft to withstand the extreme temperatures encountered during high-speed travel. Additionally, the 2707 would fly at altitudes higher than those typically reached by conventional jets. This required increased pressurization within the cabin to maintain a comfortable environment for the passengers. As a result, the cabin windows had to be smaller in order to handle the higher differential pressure. The windows on the 2707 were only 6 inches in size, significantly smaller compared to those found on standard aircraft. However, despite the reduced window size, passengers aboard the 2707 would still enjoy an advanced in-flight entertainment system. The cabin would be fully equipped with numerous televisions, offering passengers a range of entertainment options during their journey. This feature aims to enhance the overall passenger experience on the supersonic aircraft. Boeing had high hopes that the Boeing 2707 would be ready for commercial service by the mid-1970s. However, the development of this aircraft was pushing the technological capabilities of the 1960s to their limits. In reality, the 2707 was far from being ready for operational use. One of the major challenges in building the 2707 was the requirement for a titanium alloy aircraft. While titanium offered excellent heat resistance properties necessary for supersonic flight, it posed difficulties in terms of cost and manufacturing. Titanium was an expensive material, and working with it presented unique challenges in terms of fabrication and construction techniques. These factors added complexity and cost to the development process. Indeed, the swing wing mechanism, which was a key feature of the Boeing 2707, proved to be complex and excessively heavy. The challenges associated with this mechanism, both in terms of design and engineering, became increasingly evident. As a result, Boeing faced significant difficulties in making it work as intended. Eventually, the company had to go back to the drawing board and explore alternative options. Boeing ultimately decided to redesign the aircraft with a more conventional delta wing, similar to the wing configuration of the Concorde. This shift in design was necessary to overcome the obstacles posed by the swing wing mechanism, 
and find a more feasible and practical solution. However, as Boeing grappled with these massive engineering hurdles, there was an even bigger problem on the horizon. When aircraft travel at supersonic speeds, they create intense sonic booms that are audible throughout their entire supersonic flight trajectory. If a Boeing 2707 were to cruise at an altitude of 60,000 feet, its sonic boom could be detected as far as 30 miles from its flight path. It was approximated that a solitary transcontinental journey would result in sonic booms being heard by more than 5 million individuals. The presence of supersonic jets flying above resulted in sonic booms that were powerful enough to cause windows in skyscrapers to crack. Consequently, the tests had to be terminated prematurely. Despite over 15,000 residents filing complaints, officials chose to ignore them. The pursuit of practical considerations took a back seat, as the competitiveness of the American aviation industry and national pride were deemed more significant. However, as the 1960s progressed, the program faced numerous technical obstacles. The program failed to meet the ambitious requirements, and a movement opposing supersonic transport SST, had gained traction. As public opposition to sonic booms intensified, concerns began to extend beyond noise disturbances. There were fears that a fleet of hundreds of supersonic airliners flying at high altitudes would release significant amounts of nitrogen oxide, potentially leading to the destruction of the ozone layer. In 1969, Richard Nixon assumed the presidency. By this time, America's supersonic transport program had faced significant delays, with its budget spiraling out of control and the public support waning. The government commissioned two thorough reviews of the program, both of which questioned the long-term feasibility of supersonic transports and recommended discontinuing public funding for the program. The fate of the Boeing 2707 now rested on President Nixon's shoulders, as he faced the difficult decision ahead. It became increasingly clear that the days of the Boeing 2707 were numbered. The economic situation in the United States worsened and the program became a highly debated and controversial political issue. In 1971, the US Senate made the decision to reject any further funding for the project, effectively bringing an end to the Boeing 2707. Two years later, the Federal Aviation Administration FAA, implemented a ban on all civil supersonic aviation over the United States. This ban was a response to concerns about sonic boom noise greatly impacting the sales potential of the Concorde and casting doubts on the feasibility of any future supersonic transport projects. The ban had significant implications for the commercial viability and future prospects of supersonic aviation. During the 1960s, there were optimistic predictions that hundreds of supersonic transport SST, aircraft would dominate the skies in the decades to come. However, the reality turned out to be quite different. While the Concorde, one of the most well-known SSTs, did fly for many years, only 14 of them were ever delivered, and they were operated by just two airlines. The Soviet Union's Tu-144, another SST, only operated regular passenger service for a brief period of eight months on a single route. When the Boeing 2707 project was cancelled, the factors that had previously driven the pursuit of supersonic aviation, such as the threat of foreign competition and concerns about national prestige, were no longer significant enough to outweigh the mounting political, economic, and environmental pressures. The cancellation of the project reflected a shift in public sentiment towards government programs and a decline in optimism regarding technological advancements. The combination of limited commercial success for the Concorde and Tu-144 along with the cancellation of the Boeing 2707 project, underscored the challenges faced by supersonic aviation and signaled a decrease in public enthusiasm for such endeavors. In conclusion, America failed in supersonic transport because they entered the markets driven by national pride, aiming to compete with Europe and the USSR. While national pride and competition can be powerful motivators, they alone cannot ensure the success of a complex technological endeavor.
This push for national pride and competition had unintended consequences that contributed to America's failure in supersonic transport. Here are some key factors. Unrealistic expectations In the pursuit of national pride, expectations were set unrealistically high for supersonic transport. The assumption that there would be a substantial market for high-speed air travel across the United States and globally did not materialize as anticipated. The Concorde itself faced challenges in attracting a sustainable customer base. Given the limited demand for supersonic flights, and the high operating costs associated with such aircraft. While the desire to compete with Europe and the USSR in supersonic transport certainly played a role in America's pursuit, it is essential to recognize that technological advancements, market demand, financial considerations, and regulatory constraints are equally critical factors that influenced the outcome. National pride alone cannot guarantee the success of a complex and costly technological venture like supersonic transport.